welcome everybody to the Royal Statistical Society this evening. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, we're particularly pleased to be doing this event again in association with Sense About Science and we've been working with them on quite a few things recently so it's uh, great to acknowledge their role in making this event happen. Um, from the Royal Statistical Society point of view, this is the first in a series of 180th anniversary lectures that we're doing. Um, and we wanted to do the lectures this year um, in large extent to recognise the strategy that we launched last year that really took us right back to our roots in 1834, of seeing the society as a campaigning body looking out and trying to influence public policy and the world around us. And the society has always been strong on that, um, but the chance today with data everywhere, the data economy, the data society, big data, this, that and the other, um, this is an opportunity for all of us who care about statistics to celebrate it. And this series of lectures will give us a chance to give a focal point to those celebrations. So um, it's great to see you here as part of that. Um, but of course, looking around the room, I see lots and lots of friends who are members of the RSS, but lots and lots of about-to-be friends who are not yet members of the RSS. <laughs> um, and we survive by the generosity of our members wanting to be part of our movement. Um, there are leaflets on your chairs that you will be um, encouraged to look at, certainly by me and by, by everybody. Um, so if you hear something you like this evening, no pressure, David, um, <laughs> please sign up and join us. The more of us who join, the more we can make a difference um, to the world around us through the power of numbers. So it is wonderful to be launching this series of 180 anniversary events with David Hand. I mean, David is um, the only living person to have his name on that amazing board twice. What are the chances of that? <laughs> um, the chances of that has nothing to do with probability. They are all to do with David's erudition um, and incredible um, contribution to the world of statistics. He will talk about his book, and he probably won't be too modest to plug it and get you to buy it, but there is an amazing offer on the book downstairs later, so do think about buying it. It is a wonderful read. It does that very, very unusual thing of combining something that makes you smile and makes you think. So with that plug, David, the floor is yours. So thank you very much in, indeed, thank you all for coming. Whoever thought that I would see so many people, many of you non-statisticians, voluntarily attending a statistics lecture, because that's what you're about to get. So in 2012, is the volume okay at the back? Yeah. In, in 2012, I attended the Royal Statistical Society's conference in Telford. I went up to the uh, hotel reception desk and said to the receptionist, my name's David Hand. She looked at her computer screen and said, hmm, there are two David Hands with us this week. I was naturally amazed. And then she said something I'd never been asked before. She said, and which one are you? <laughs> now, <laughs> this gave me the opportunity for one of the only two times in my life I've thought quickly. I said, the real one, of course. <laughs> Unfortunately, she wasn't so impressed, she just sighed and said, they all say that. <laughs> the point about this story is that it was an unusual coincidence. It had an impact on me. You might well have had similar sorts of coincidences yourself, like this, for instance, thinking of someone just before they phone you, or bumping into an old friend in a strange town. You're in Paris, for instance, on holiday, and you bump into an old school friend, for instance. Or you meet someone who's got the same birthday as you, I've got an interesting story to tell you about that, if we have time at the end. Or perhaps finding that the number of your house, or your, the last four digits of your national insurance number, or your car number plate, or whatever, keeps cropping up in other situations. These are all little coincidences, little improbable events, which happen to all of us, these sorts of things. I think most of us have such stories to tell. But they do make you wonder just what's going on. Could, can these things just be purely accidental? Or is something about the universe that we don't understand? Are we perhaps um, wrong, a little bit wrong, about the notion of cause and effect? Is 
did something, bring that other David Hand and me to that hotel at the same time, for instance. Or, to go even further out on a limb, is something exerting an invisible influence on our lives? The answer to that last question is, in fact, yes. In a way, something is in exerting a, an invisible influence on our lives. But it's not a mystical, supernatural kind of force. It's just mathematics. It's just a consequence of standard probability theory, but looked at from an unusual, unusual perspective. And the, uh, I, I encapsulate that perspective in this single phrase, the improbability principle. The improbability principle sums it up, and my expression of the improbability principle is that it's extremely improbable events are commonplace. Now, when you look at that, you think, well, that's nonsense, isn't it? Um, if something's extremely improbable, it has to be very rare. It's not going to happen very often. So how can it possibly be commonplace? It looks like a contradiction. And that's really what I want to talk about for, for, for this talk. I'm going to resolve that contradiction. I'm going to explore that and show you that the improbability principle is, in fact, true. Now, the improbability principle, um, highly improbable events are commonplace, isn't a single law like e, Einstein's e equals mc squared, but it's a, a, a set of five laws, in fact. I've listed them there. The law of inevitability, the law of truly large numbers of selection of the probability lever, and the law of near enough. It's sort of analogous to Newton's three laws of motion or the four laws of, of thermodynamics. And of course, this is my take on this. I think if anybody else sat down and thought about these things, tried to articulate laws describing the improbability principle, they'd come up with something very similar. Perhaps not exactly the same. I think the first two or three would be the same. Maybe the others would be slightly different. But the same is also true of Newton's laws of motion and um, the laws of thermodynamics. Some people argue that there should be a fifth law there. So, but, but this is my articulation of these um, five laws. And what I'm going to do now in this talk is go through these laws. In the first half of the talk, I'm going to go through them. So, what's the law of inevitability? In a phrase, it just says something must happen. I should say that the first two of these laws, the law of inevitability and the law of truly large numbers, are pretty straightforward. You'll recognize them, and when I state them, you'll think, well, that's not so wonderful, is it? Something must happen, for instance. So, if I flip a coin, for example, you know it's going to come up heads, or tails, or perhaps it would land on it on, on edge or fall down a crack in the floor. I'll call all those other things other. So it's going to come up heads, or tails, or other, one of the, thir the third sets of possibilities. One of those three things has to happen. Something must happen. That's the law of inevitability. One of those three things is inevitable. Here's another little example. If you hit a golf ball, you can't tell on which blade of grass it will land, but you do know it's going to land on one of them. I guess I should also here have the category other, but you see what I mean. What about lotteries? You can't tell which lottery ticket will come up beforehand, but you know for sure one of them will. The law of inevitability. It's inevitable that one of the all of the possible lottery tickets must come up. And I'm going to build on that now to show you that the law of inevitability isn't as trivial as it looks like and you can, in fact, take advantage of it. And I'm going to illustrate with this the case of the International Lotto Fund. There are other examples of this kind. This is a well-known one, and I'm going to just illustrate with this, but there are others of this kind. In 1992, February, uh, the Virginia State Lottery jackpot had rolled over so that it was worth $27 million. Now, this lottery is a 644 lottery. That means you have to choose six numbers out of 44 numbers. And if you do the math on that, you find that that means there are 7 million different tickets so that any one has got a 1 in 7 million chance of winning. So for an outlay of a dollar, you have a 1 in 7 million chance of winning whatever the jackpot is, $27 million after these rollovers when it hadn't been won. Of course, what that means is that if you spent $7 million and bought all of the tickets, the law of inevitability, you'd have them all covered. You are certain to be holding the jackpot winning ticket so you'll win the jackpot or a share of it. And this is exactly what this International Lotto Fund did. It was a consortium of 2,500 small investors, international, all over the world. And what they did was get together, the organizers got them together, and uh, asked each of them to pay, I think it's $2,800, so that they had $7 million and set out to buy all of the tickets. 
So they were guaranteed covering the jackpot winning ticket. Now, first, the first thing to think about here is the logistics. The, this, this lottery has two draws a week, so you've got four days. Jack, no jackpot, no jackpot, roll over, roll over, roll over. It's going to be 27 million next time. You've now got four days to buy 27 million, uh, to, to, to buy 7 million lottery tickets. A lot of running around organization involved in this, and this is going to have a consequence. As it happened, it was too much for them. They only managed to buy 5 million of the 7 million tickets, which means they had about a quarter chance of not holding the jackpot winning one. Now, can you imagine? You've got a pile of 5, minute, five million tickets on your, um, on your table. You know that you know the number which won the jackpot, and you're now going through, biting your nails, looking. <laughs> As it happens, one of the five million was um, the jackpot winning one. But there are other risks to this. There's no guarantee that somebody else wouldn't also buy the jackpot ticket. You know, maybe someone who just spent one dollar and just by chance had the jackpot winning ticket. And then you'd have to share your 27 million dollars You'd only have half of that to play with. And some numbers in lotteries don't just have one or two winners, three. This is quite common, I'm sure you're aware of that. But occasionally, you can have thousands of people buying the same ticket. So, for instance, the number, for some reason, the number, the lottery ticket, one, two, three, four, five, six, is very popular. And you may get 5,000 people buying that ticket. Imagine if that had come up. They got the jackpot winning ticket amongst their five million. 5,000 other people also had that. Suddenly their 27 million starts to decrease to about $5,000. So that's one risk, and you can't do anything about that. And there's another risk. The lottery operators, after they tried to claim their, their, their winnings, lottery operators pointed out that one of the regulations of the lottery was that you had to pay for the ticket and buy them, actually print them out in the same place. And they hadn't done that. They'd sort of written a check for $100,000 and then printed them out somewhere else. They argued, the, the syndicate argued, that they didn't, that they didn't know where the, whether they'd paid for and printed out the uh, jackpot winning one in, in the same place. And in the end, the lottery operators, after deciding that they couldn't guarantee winning the case, decided to give them the money. But I want to pause here and think about this. The logistics is complicated. The nail biting is complicated, given that they didn't manage to buy all 5 million tickets. Each of the investors would have had to put up nearly $3,000. If they'd won, the jackpot would then be split amongst all of them. They'd have made $8,000 profit. You begin to wonder if it might not be easier just to get a job. But that's the law of inevitability. You know, had they bought all of this, managed to buy all of the seven million tickets, it's guaranteed that one of those would be the jackpot winning ticket. They're using the law of inevitability. My second law, also a fairly straightforward one, is the law of truly large numbers. Not the law of large numbers, which is a, a, a familiar law in probability, which um, basically says that as you increase sample sizes, so averages converge to a particular number. That, that's a, one of the sort of fundamental axioms, almost, of probability. The law of truly large numbers is a bit different. It says, if you've got a large enough number of opportunities, any outrageous thing is likely to happen. So, if I flip a coin, if I go on enough, millions and millions of times, you wouldn't be surprised if at some point, 20 consecutive heads came up. And, and here's... Um, ah, I'm going to come back to lightning later on, but this is my first sort of foray into it. Around the world, in general, the probability of being killed by lightning is pretty small. It's about one in 300,000. But the world's got seven billion people in it, a truly large number of, of, of people. And if you do the calculations of this, you find that the chance that nobody will be killed in a particular year by lightning strike is absolutely tiny. And in fact, around 24,000 people are killed by lightning strikes each year. And I've got a little illustration of this if this works. Keep your eye in the center bottom of the screen. Now, someone would be, have to be very unlucky <laughs> to be struck by lightning. I want to put you out of your misery now, or tension. He's not killed, okay? You'll see him get up. You'll see him move and get up in a minute. But he was very unlucky. A one in 300,000 chance of being struck by lightning. Um, 
Well, apparently he wasn't so unlucky. There's an old adage, adage isn't there, that um, lightning never strikes twice. So, I mean, he's been struck by lightning and survived. Luckier than you, because you haven't yet been struck by lightning. And you may not survive. 24,000 people killed a year. But he's sort of hold, beginning to hold his head. He, he, he's um, clearly suffering from it. Unlucky, or perhaps he, he's lucky, because, um, as we all know, lightning never strikes twice. <laughs> <laughs> He survives that as well. <laughs> the law of truly large numbers, seven billion people in the world, I and mean, he was particularly unlucky that he was wandering in front of the camera when it happened. But, uh, but it crops up in all sorts of other places. It caused a media storm in 2009, for instance, when on two consecutive draws of the Bulgarian state lottery, exactly the same six numbers came up. The uh, Sports minister, um, I don't know why lottery is a sports, but maybe the sports minister ordered an investigation. You know, is some fraud being perpetrated? Were the lottery operators really just reproducing numbers? Was it just a, a CGI demonstrated, it, uh, generated image that seemed to show balls being drawn and so on? But the law of truly large numbers says we should expect to see such things happen. And again, if you do the maths with the Bulgarian state lottery, you find draws twice a week, um, you'll find that it's more likely than not, probably it's greater than a half, that some two draws will match if you keep rolling that thing on for 43 years. 43 years is enough that it becomes more likely than not that some two tickets will match exactly. Some two jackpot winning tickets will match exactly. Maybe not consecutive weeks, but some out of the 43 years. The law of truly large numbers, there are so many draws in 43 years. And in fact, we can go further than this. If you think of the number of lotteries around the world, and there are a lot I've discovered since um, getting interested in this area, you'd expect to see duplicate sets of numbers drawn somewhere amongst all those lotteries, even indeed on consecutive draws like the Bulgarian state lottery. And in fact, it would be amazing if we never saw two sets of identical lottery numbers, the tickets being identical. And since it would be amazing, and since you now, in my calculations, recognize that you'd expect to see this happen, you won't be at all surprised to hear that it happened in the Israel lottery a few weeks apart in 2010. And you won't be at all surprised to hear it happened on the North Carolina cash five lottery in consecutive weeks. And these are not, of course, the only examples. But you'd expect to see it because there are so many lotteries around the world rolling on week after week, year after year, truly large numbers. Lotteries, lotteries are a great sort of toy for, to explore in this sort of area because they strip away some of the ambiguity and uncertainties of the real world and you can actually just look at the probability and the, and the maths. Later I'm going to come back to um, introducing the human aspect but initially lotteries are very good for this sort of thing. Here's another example of the, truly large, <laughs> the law of uh, truly large numbers introducing a surprise, a particularly painful one I think. It involved this woman Maureen Wilcox who bought winning tickets for two state lotteries in the US. Unfortunately, if you read the bottom line, <laughs> I, I kicked off by saying, you know, it makes you think, it makes you wonder if there's some power up there manipulating your lives. Now, I think she must have thought there's somebody with a particularly twisted sense of humor. <laughs> so those are my first two laws. They're pretty straightforward, um, but nevertheless, they do have concealed depths. The, th the third one, the law of selection, is altogether more subtle. One form of it says you can make things as likely as you want if you choose after the event. I'll illustrate that with a couple of simple examples first. The first one is a little story about arrows in the barn. This is a, probably a familiar story to many of you. You're walking along a country lane and you come across a barn and on the side of the barn there are lots of painted targets and in the centre of each target there's an arrow. And you think, wow, this guy is a really hot archer. And you carry on walking and you turn backwards to face the uh, barn, the other side of the barn, and you see there's a man there. And there are lots of arrows in the side of the barn, and this man is painting targets round those arrows. He's choosing after the event. He can make it as probability of one of having an arrow in the center of each target. The law of selection, he's choosing after the event. And here's another little story. This is from when I was young. I was fascinated by the ability that food producers had to produce jars of whole walnuts. Because whenever I tried to do it, I'd get the walnut, put it in a nutcracker, gradually increase the pressure. You know, I didn't want to 
that it suddenly gradually increase the pressure just to try to crack the shell and not the nut and gradually increase it and gradually increase it and then bang and I'd end up with bits of broken nut and shell all over the floor. Maybe one in ten times I'd get it right, but not very often. But clearly food producers could do it because they could produce jars of whole walnuts. And then when I get older, I discovered that they were no better than me, perhaps a little bit better than me, but in principle, no better than me. But they applied the law of selection. What they did was do what I'd just done. And every time, the one in 10 times that they got a whole walnut, they'd take it, put it in a jar, till the, keep doing that until the jar was full, and then stick a label on it, whole walnuts. The other ones, the bits of broken shell and, and, and nut all over the floor, they'd pick up the bits of nut, put them in a jar labeled walnut pieces. They were applying the law of selection. I only saw the jars of whole walnuts. Here's another little example. Jean Dixon was a very famous American psychic, and here's one of her predictions. And you can see, you can see why she was famous. So four years before um, John Kennedy was elected, she predicted that a, in this election, uh, uh, a Democrat would be elected, and he would then be assassinated or die in office. Incidentally, the assassinated or die is an example of the law of near enough, which I'm going to come to in a moment. But this is one of her predictions that she was famous for. You may be less impressed with her psychic abilities if I tell you that she also made some other predictions. For instance, that someone from the Soviet Union would be the first to walk on the moon and that World War III would begin in 1958. The point about Jean Dixon was that she applied two of the laws of the improbability principle. The law of truly large numbers, make a lot of predictions, you're sure to get some right if you make enough. And then the law of selection. Forget the ones you got wrong, emphasize the ones you got right, like the presidential election prediction. Here's another little example of the law of selection. This paper um, was published in the Wall Street Journal, a paper by Pharrell and Bandler eight years ago. It's worth reading it if you haven't come across it. And what these two authors did was they looked at the dates at which share options were awarded to company directors, and they spotted that for quite a few, for some, immediately after they'd been awarded the share options, the, prices, the share prices went through the roof. They made huge amounts of money. Now, the improbability principle can be used in several ways to explore this. One is, well, maybe Pharrell and Bambler looked at lots and lots and lots of share option allocations, and, you know, some of them are going to purely by chance, show this sort of phenomenon just by accident after the options had been awarded, the prices would leap through the roof. But they allowed for that in their calculations. And having allowed for it, there's another possible way of explaining this, which is the law of selection. If you look back in time and are able fraudulently to decide when you had been awarded those shares, to choose the time at which you were awarded the shares, you could naturally choose the times just before the share prices go through the roof. And that's what appeared to be happened. And what appeared to happen here, and if you look at the um, probabilities associated with these, these events, you can see that they are extremely small probabilities. The law of selection in fraudulent fraud, fraud seems to explain them much better. So my next law is the law of the probability lever. The law of the probability lever says that slight changes can make highly improbable events almost certain. Let me give you an example. Back to the lightning. In the United States, about 100 people get killed by lightning each year. You recall that it was 24,000 worldwide. Pro rata, this is far fewer. This is about a tenth of the number you'd expect. So the probability of being killed by a lightning strike in the US is about 1 in 3 million, not 1 in 300,000, about a tenth of the worldwide probability. Now why is that? Well, because of an application of the law of the probability lever. People in the US, the US is a, a developed country. People spend their time in office blocks, meetings like we're, we are. They spend less time in open fields. Uh, the office blocks have lightning conductors down that are protected, they're, they're um, hardened against lightning strikes and so on. So slight changes in the circumstances or conditions uh, have, have resulted in a dramatic change to the, um, to the probability. Now let me give you, continuing the lightning theme, let me give you a couple of very well-known examples. The first, Major Walter Summerford. 
He was, um, in 1918, soon after the First World War, he was knocked off his horse in a field in Flanders and his legs were temporarily, paral temporarily paralyzed. Uh, six years later, he'd moved to Canada, sitting under a tree, fishing, and again struck by lightning, this time paralyzing his right side. And then, uh, six years later again, he was walking in a park, and now he's completely paralyzed by lightning strike. I don't know if you, it's just occurred to me, I don't know if you remember the film, the Monty Python team film, The Black Knight or something, he has his arms bitten off and he's, he's hopping around saying, it's just a scratch, it's just a scratch. I feel that uh, Major Summerford falls into that sort of category. You will be relieved to hear that he died a couple of years later, not from a lightning strike. However, as if to overcome the oversight, his gravestone was struck by lightning. <laughs> I haven't forgotten about you, lad. <laughs> he, he, he was terribly unfortunate. But the law of the probability lever... He wasn't sitting in an office block. He was riding a horse in a field. He was fishing under a tree in a thunderstorm over there. And he was walking in a park. The, the probability has shifted, making it more likely that he would be struck by lightning. And here's another classic example, Roy Sullivan. He was struck by lightning in uh, 1942. In fact, he was struck before this, he said, when he was a child. But that doesn't appear in the official figures. Um, in 1942, he lost his big toenail. 69, he lost his eyebrows. 70, his seared left shoulder. 72, his hair set on fire. His hair regrew, but unfortunately next year it was um, burnt off again in a, <laughs> another lightning strike. 76, lightning injured his ankle. 77, chest and stomach burned. Now, <laughs> clearly he's not just unlucky. Somehow the law of the probability lever is coming into play. And you'll see immediately how it's coming into play when you learn that he was a Virginia Park Ranger. He wasn't sitting in an office like we are. He, he, he was uh, putting himself in a vulnerable position. You might have thought that after a while you would think, hmm, maybe I'll get a different job. But that's, uh... Let me give you another example of um, uh, uh, the law of the probability lever. Um, Sebastian Mallaby has written a very good book about the history of hedge funds called More Money Than God. And writing about the year um, 1987, he said this, an event such as the crash wouldn't be anticipated to occur even if the stock market were to remain open for 20 billion years. Now, the universe is only 14 billion years old. So this gives me an opportunity to describe something called Borel's Law. Many of you have a mathematics background and you'll recognize the name Borel. Emile Borel was a very eminent French mathematician. And he came up with what he called the fundamental law of probability, which said that sufficiently improbable events are impossible. A bit like the improbability principle. When you hear that, sufficiently improbable events are impossible, you think, well, that's wrong, isn't it? Sufficiently improbable events just don't happen very often, but they're not impossible. They're certain to happen. It's just not very often. Though it's not quite what he meant. What he meant was we should act as if they're impossible. So an event like this which is only going to happen once every 20 billion years, it's so improbable, it's, you know, not, you're unlikely to see it happen in the history of the universe, it means you should act as if it's impossible. You shouldn't come out of your front door thinking, you know, maybe there'll be one of these events. Um, you should regard it as practically impossible in human terms. So something's going wrong here. This event ought to be essentially impossible. It only happen once every 20 billion years, but it happened. I'm going to move on 10 years to uh, 1998. This is uh, Roger Lowenstein in the book When Genius Failed about the history of the collapsed hedge fund long-term capital management. He said the figures implied it would take a so-called 10 sigma event for the firm to lose all its capital in one year. A 10 sigma event is one which is 10, more than 10 standard deviations from the mean. Incredibly low probability again, but it happened. Let me move on another 10 years, roughly speaking. Bill Bonner in Money Week, writing about 2007. Things were only supposed to happen, uh, th things were happening that were only supposed to happen about once every 100,000 years. Now, one in 100,000 years isn't as small as one in 20 billion, but it's still pretty small. You shouldn't see these sorts of things happening. Now, at this point, I was going to move on another 10 years to the financial crash of 2017-18, but I decided to let you discover that one for yourself. I'm just going to move on three years to David Gartman writing about the year 2010. So he said, what we witnessed yesterday was a series of movements of utterly unprecedented proportions 
With currency price changes that are, at, that are at the sixth, seventh, and eighth standard deviations from the norm, it means from the mean. But again, lots of standard deviations away from the mean, very much in the tails of distributions, very unusual events. You're not going to see them happen, but we are seeing them happen. And in fact, I've given you a whole series of examples of this every 10 years or so. Um, a couple of economists, Reinhardt and Rogoff, wrote a, a book about financial crashes, and they went back hundreds of years showing that with a painful regularity, these financial crashes, every 20 years or so, a financial crash seems to occur. So when Gartman says, utterly unprecedented, I think singularly precedented might be a, a better way of putting it. So what's going on? We're seeing these events, one in 20 billion years, one in uh, 100,000, one in 6, 7, 8, 10 standard deviations away from me. They shouldn't happen. They ought to be impossible. Borel's law, they really ought to be so rare that we never see them happen. What's going on? Well, here's a little illustration of what's going on, and it's the law of the probability lever. What I've plotted in the continuous curve there is a normal distribution, which I imagine everybody in this room is familiar with. And what I've also plotted in the broken line is a, what looks rather similar distribution called the Cauchy distribution. In fact, if I'd thought of this beforehand, I would have made those two lines thicker so that you really couldn't have been able to distinguish them. They're pretty close. You'd need a reasonably large sample to be able to distinguish, to tell that one was one instead of the other. But the difference between them has huge implications, as you can see in the text beneath. For the standard normal distribution, the Gaussian distribution, the probability of being 10 or more standard deviations from the mean, that far from the mean, being that far out in the tail of the distribution, is 1 in 10 to the 23. It's a tiny probability. For this other imperceptibly different distribution, it's just 1 in 30. The tails are completely different. In fact, you can see what I've written there, the, the, the seconds, <laughs> 4.2, with all those zeros, uh, uh, bigger than the first. So, the law of the probability lever. If you based your probability modeling on the continuous line here, the normal distribution, the Gaussian distribution, you wouldn't just be wrong. You would be really wrong, which might explain some of those financial crashes. And I have to say that people who work in financial mathematics and this sort of area do know all this. But nevertheless, you still see people talking about 10 sigma events based on sort of normal distribution type arguments. I'm not telling, I'm not saying anything new here. I'm just con contrasting these two probability models. A slight change can have a huge impact on the probabilities, the law of the probability lever. And then finally, my last um, law is, is the law of near enough. The law of near enough just says events which are sufficiently similar are regarded as identical. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a little example. In 1986, a man named Bill Shaw survived a train crash which killed 13 people, a nasty crash. And then 15 years later, his wife also survived a fatal train crash. Now, rail travel in the UK is extremely safe. Fatal train crashes, uh, despite what you might think from the media interest in such things, are very, very rare. So this is a highly improbable event that Bill and his wife uh, should be involved in, 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 in these two fatal train crashes. But think about it for a minute. First, 15-year gap between them. They didn't they happen on the same day or on the same week or on the same year. There was a 15-year gap. Had it been a 20- or 30-year gap, we would probably still have been struck by this. And it wasn't Bill in both of the crashes. It was Bill in one and Ginny in the other, his wife in the other. We would have been just as surprised or taken note of it, remarked on it, if it had been Bill and his brother, or his parents, or his children, or his friend from school, or a workmate, or something. And you see what's happening here. We're expanding the interval, we're expanding the people involved, and every time we expand like that, we make the event more and more likely that something will fall into that, into that interval. Events which are sufficiently similar are regarded as identical, and we, know, and we notice them. Here's another light-hearted little example of this. Sir Alistair Hardy was a very eminent marine biologist. Um, after he retired from marine biology, he, he switched to an altogether more speculative area of, I was going to say science, but no, of research. That's what I wanted to say. 
Um, and he, he carried out a number of experiments in ESP and related areas, and one in particular, a big experiment on telepathy. He was an eminent scientist. He knew what he was doing. The design of the experiment was very good. He, he set up a number of transmitters who were given drawings to look at. They looked at a drawing. And in another part of the room, unable to communicate or see what was going on, were receivers who had to try to intuit, to telepathically understand what pictures the transmitters were looking at. And the receivers would draw, draw pictures and then Alistair Hardy and his assistants would gather them up, gather them up and, and see if they got them right. Now there's a thing, got them right. Unlike throwing dice or tossing coins or, or thinking of numbers, um, pictures, there's a certain ambiguity, we're beginning to drift into the human aspect of this, of whether they match exactly. When do you, how do you tell if a transmitted image is exactly the same as the received image, or the other way around? And they were aware of this, but what I want to do is give you some examples of things they regarded as exact matches. There's, there's a book of that about this, which has got lots of these examples in it. It's, it's uh, very interesting. So here's one of the transmitted images. This one was one of the images which was shown to the transmitters. They all concentrated on it and elsewhere, shielded from them, not able to hear them or, or, or see them. The receivers all sat down and tried to work out what was being sent to them. And this is one of the received image, images, which is regarded as an exact match. You tell me. Here's another one. Looks like a pyramid to me. That's a transmitted image. And this is the received image from one of the receivers. It conveniently says mountain and road at the top, not pyramids, but exactly the same. Or the law of near enough. Here's another one. This is clearly Noor's art. On the right, there's a hippopotamus, and there are giraffes and some other animals on the left. And here's one of the received images. Is it exactly the same? What it actually says underneath is railway station. <laughs> but it was regarded as a perfect match. Uh, this is a, a per little personal little example. I was at a conference in um, St. Anne's College in Oxford a few years ago, and this is, this is the crest of the college. And they gave out a, a, a notepad to the conference delegates. And the conference and the notepad had a, an artist's impression of the crest on it, and is the artist's impression. And sometime later, I was working at my desk, and the notepad was on my desk, and it was upside down. Here we are. And I noticed, Lord, near enough, I noticed that in the bottom right and left was a perfect, almost perfect, near enough image of Bart Simpson. <laughs> Not quite, but the law of near enough. I noticed it. I thought, wow, what a coincidence. I was, I was at my keyboard writing to the principal of the college and said, did you, saying, did you know your um, artist was having... And I thought, perhaps not. Perhaps not. <laughs> Law of near enough. I noticed it. I thought, what a coincidence. Now, each of these laws can separately, as in the examples I've given, um, make apparently highly improbable events happen. But when the laws work together, they can be even more astounding. So I'm going to give you this little, how, how to be a successful, how to make a lot of money from selling stock tips. You might have heard this before. Funnily enough, I heard, um, this isn't where I got it from, but I heard Mervyn King giving this advice, perhaps not giving this advice, telling this story. <laughs> and this makes use of two things, the law of inevitability and the law of selection. So what you do is you, you identify 1,024 people to 512, that is half of them, you say stock market's going to go up next week, and for the others you say it's going to go down next week. Now you're going to be right for 512 one way or the other. You forget the ones you got wrong, you just take the ones you got right, and then for half of those, half of the ones you got right, 256 of them, you say next week it's going to go up, and the other half you say next week it's going to go down. You're going to be right for one of those 256, and you keep doing this for 10 weeks. At the end of those 10 weeks, you have got a person who has seen you make correct predictions for 10 successive weeks of the stock market. You've forgotten all the others, 1,023. You don't care about them anymore. This guy has, thinks you've got a really good algorithm or, or insider knowledge or whatever it happens to be. And then, of course, at that point, you say, you're going to have to pay me for the 11th week tip. Now, I've been talking about the... Um, probability aspects, the mathematical aspects. I now want to bring in the human aspects because these things 
are really to do with our perceptions of the world. We notice things, we pay attention to them, we regard them as significant. And I just want to illustrate how we are susceptible to these sorts of distortions by giving you one little example of what's called the conjunction fallacy. So here's a little description of somebody, a man named John, who initially took a degree in maths, followed it with a PhD in astrophysics. After that, he worked in the physics department of a university for a while, but then found a job in the back room of an algorithm trading company, developing highly sophisticated statistical models for predicting movements in financial markets. In his spare time, he attends science fiction conventions. As I say this, I have realized that I'm describing some of my colleagues from Winton Capital. That wasn't my intention. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to ask you a, a question. Which has the higher probability? First, that John is married with two children. Or second, that John's married with two children and likes to spend his evenings tackling mathematical puzzles and playing computer games. Now, if you haven't seen this before, you might well think, well, clearly B is a better description. It matches the description I've just given you. That, therefore, has the higher probability. But a moment's thought shows you that can't be the case. B is more specific than A. A includes more than B. So A must have the higher probability. But people, especially without thinking about it, uh, get this wrong. And there are many other ways that human sort of intuition about probability is misleading. I'm not going to go through these examples. There are a number of very eminent researchers who've made a great study of this. Of course, people like Daniel Kahneman, Gerd Gigerenza, Daniel Arely, uh, David Myers. It's become a sort of minor industry studying these sorts of things. Um, but it all feeds into our propensity to see uh, unusual events, to see coincidences. I'm just going to give you one example, because it's got a nice picture. The example I'm going to give you goes under the name of pareidolia, and what it is is the tendency, tendency to see patterns in random data. So, for instance, faces in clouds. Now, there aren't really faces in those clouds, but we see them, the human brain. It doesn't just happen with clouds, of course. Buzz like they're in a carrot. Um, oh, this one might be a bit painful. It's uh, an ultrasound scan, but it's not an ultrasound scan of a fetus. It's an ultrasound scan of a testicular tumour. And then, of course, this one, which you might have seen before, this amazing structure in the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. Not the white ellipse, which would indeed be an amazing structure, <laughs> but the initials of Stephen Hawking inside the ellipse. Somebody trying to tell us something? And, of course, it doesn't just happen in clouds and vegetables. It also happens in rock faces all over the place. And I, I couldn't resist this one, the strange natural rock formation of matter. <laughs> And the face on Mars appeared not long ago. There are other images of this particular uh, structure taken from a different angle, which show that it's just an accident of the way one, one's looking at it. And then there's my favorite of these kinds of things, which is Mother Teresa in a bun. So I've been talking about sort of, I started with everyday events, you know, bumping into somebody, an old friend in a strange town, that kind of thing, winning lottery. Maybe not everyday events, um, but uh, you hear of people it happening to people. Indeed, law of truly large numbers, you hear of people winning a lottery twice, which always seems so unfair to me. But, um, but what I want to move, do now is sort of show that these sorts of ideas, the improbability principle, the laws composing it, also apply at a much higher level. And one obvious level is evolution. This is a manifestation of two of the laws, the truly large numbers. The Earth's about four billion years old. Um, a lot of opportunity for things to happen, lots of things going on in parallel. But truly large numbers. And then the law of selection, the creature with a larger claws gets to eat the food and breed and, and, and so on. So two of the laws of the um, improbability principle driving evolution and why we're here. And then, of course, the ultimate illustration of the law of selection. The anthropic principle, there are different versions of the anthropic principle. There are at the extreme strong end crackpot ones, which are clearly wrong, and at the other end, quite sensible ones, which are, I think, actually right. The anthropic principle, the ultimate instance of the law of selection, basically says the universe has to be like it is, or we wouldn't be here to see it. Okay, now, the improbability principle is, um, is about 
the way the universe is. It's not a, the book isn't a business manual, but when I was writing it, I was asked, well, how can you use this? Well, this is a statistics lecture. You can use it in the same way you use other statistics. And I thought I'd just give you a little illustration. So first illustration, balancing probabilities. So if you, use the book, if, if you read the book, you'll discover that I've got a very large collection of dice. I've got weighted dice, I've got misshapen dice, I've got spherical dice, I've got a die, a die with a hundred faces. It, it works, it shows one face. Um, I've got tops. Tops are a rather unusual dice. They're used by professional gamblers and cheats. They have a five on two opposite sides. And if it's on the table, because you can't see round corners, you can't tell that. And dice mechanics can switch these into and out of the game so they can change their odds in their favour. Now these are some of the dice from my collection. You'll see the white ones, which I assure you aren't tops, they're perfectly normal dice. So opposite the five is a two and so on. And then there are the black ones. The black ones I call my beginner's dice. And the reason I call them my beginner's dice is that in many board games you need to throw a double six to decide who, who, who uh, should start the game. And people find it difficult to throw double sixes if, only, if you haven't not skilled at it. You only have a one in 36 chance of being able to throw a double six with a normal dice. So what I do is I give them these dice and I say practice with those until you can throw double six every time and then we'll grab, so they're my beginner's dice. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get someone, I won't be able to see this, get someone to choose a die and throw it a hundred times. Suppose they do that and they tell me that all a hundred times it showed a six. The question I'm going to ask is, do you think the die is white or black? Now, what's called the, uh, the uh, likelihood principle applies here. What you do is you balance the probability. The probability of getting that outcome, all the hundreds showing a six with a white die, against the probability of getting all the hundreds showing a six with a black die. And you choose the one which has got a higher probability. Or as I might put it in the context of this talk, you balance the improbabilities. Let me move on to bending probabilities. Back to lotteries. A, a 649 lottery, you remember you had to choose six numbers out of 49. The UK national lotteries of that kind, Canada has a lottery line, quite a common sort of structure for lotteries. What we're going to do now is we're going to buy one lottery ticket per week for 20 years. About a, about a thousand pounds. The probability of winning is about one in 13,000. It's two out of 27,000. In fact, two out of 26,893. Now you can increase, this is what really why you all came, you wanted to learn and know how you could increase your chance of winning the lottery, didn't you? Well, you, you heard at the beginning how you can guarantee winning the lottery. Now, for slightly less out, outlay than £14 million in, in, in the UK, um, I'm going to tell you how you can increase your chance. So we were going to buy one lottery ticket per week for 20 years for exactly the same outlay, outlay of money. What I'm going to do is buy the same number of tickets, but in one week. Different tickets, of course. I'll come back, back to that in a moment. If you do that, you increase your chance of winning. Not much, <laughs> but a little bit. Of course, I'm ignoring the sort of the opportunity to invest the money, and so I'm ignoring the economics. The probability has shifted. Of course, it also rather takes away the fun, doesn't it? You spend your thousand pounds in week one, you won't win tell you that now, and then you watch while your friend, buying one ticket a week for the next 20 years, consistently has a chance of winning. It's so irritating. Different tickets, it would clearly be ludicrous to buy the same tickets this one week, wouldn't it? You, know, you wouldn't increase your chance of winning at all. Um, you must buy different tickets, otherwise you still only have a one in, in this case, one in 14 million chance of winning if you bought if you bought the same tickets, if all your thousand odd tickets were the same. Except, of course, you must allow for the improbability principle. And in April 2013, this man, Harry Back, bought two Canadian British Columbia tickets with the same numbers and one. Now, that same week, there was a third person who bought a winning lottery ticket. And you can imagine her thinking, She's won a third of the jackpot. If only Harry Black hadn't been so stupid as to buy the two tickets with identical numbers, she would have had a half of it. What about believing probabilities? I'm getting near the end. This is a sort of test. Um, what I want you to do is think about how you can apply the, um, 
laws of the improbability principle to answer these questions. Why movie sequels, film sequels, are less likely to be big hits than the originals. One of the laws of the improbability principle applies there. Same here, why US TV programmes are better when you see them here, and conversely, UK TV programmes are better when you do them in the US. One of the laws of the improbability principle explains that, and why the gambler's fallacy is wrong. The gambler's fallacy is uh, the belief that, for instance, if a coin comes up ten heads in a row, then next time it's more likely to come up tails, because we know that on average it will come about, up about half heads and half tails. And beyond. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Um, this is the uh, improbability principle. It's composed of five laws, inevitability, the law of truly large numbers of selection, probability lever, and the law of near enough. But combined with the way we look at things, the way we selectively remember things that have happened, ignoring the trillions of other things going on around us. So, including the human mind. And that's where I'm stopping. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. You have certainly made us laugh and made us think, which is what you were billed to do. So um, we're all very grateful for that. And I hope now, while well, people have managed to get round some of the thoughts they've had to work through at the end there, um, there are some questions for David, um, and perhaps some stories as well. Um, and uh, perhaps a final plug, I suppose, because David has been modest about his plugs. They are just a small selection of the stories in the book. Um, and there are some, some crackers in there, not just in these sorts of charities, but in almost every field of life. Very, very surprising things are happening every day, often to us. And I'm slightly anxious about stepping outside this evening after this, and I'm certainly not going to buy a lottery ticket. But David, um, we are ready, I hope you are ready to answer questions from people. Who would like to go first? Back there. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for that very, very interesting talk, David. I'm, I'm Sheila Lane, and I work at Sense About Science. Uh, reflecting on John's opening remarks about celebrating stats and influencing public policy. Could you reflect a bit, David, on how well you think policymakers, and I'm thinking about the kind of people who have to make decisions and plan about mitigating risks and hazards especially, how well they understand the improbability principle and the consequences of them not understanding that? Of course, I have to make a generalization um, about how well people understand the, these sorts of things. And I suppose if I had to make that generalization, I would say not well enough. Clearly, there are people who do understand these things, but not enough such people, I think. Regarding the improbability principle, I suppose there are many aspects you could pick upon. But I think perhaps the most important thing I would pick upon is the, the, the um, probability lever aspect understanding and getting the right sort of model so that your your predictions, your probabilities are in the right ballpark. They don't have to necessarily be accurate, but they've got to be in the right ballpark. Um, you know, one in a million or one in a billion event is very small. Um, I, I think that's the most important thing. They need to understand the importance of getting a good model. Uh, hello, David. Thanks for that lecture. Uh, my name's Rimit Samaya. Uh, I'm a professional gambler. I've been involved oh, in many gambling syndicates and lottery syndicates. And I'd like to take you back to the example where that particular syndicate only bought five million tickets. Well, for me, it, that's not a problem. Um, I've been involved in some syndicates where we picked up a million or two million, and we've gone for numbers which are the least likely to come up. And as an investment tool, and for our investors, it's a very good return. And I want to ask you, if you believe so much in the power of your mathematics, why do you consider this to not be worthwhile compared to having a proper job? I was just using... Oh, okay, the, the reason is, normal people's perception of the lottery is that for a very small outlay, it will give you untold wealth. The syndicate is doing something else. It is more like a job. Uh, you know, maybe it suits a professional gambler. Because you're not suddenly going to make a huge fortune. You are spending $7 million, or your individuals were, were spending two, investing 2800 And getting $8,000 profit, provided nobody else bought the, also bought the winning ticket, if they did, they'd get less and so on. So you know, there's risk associated with it. But the, the key point there is that it's rather different from the normal perception of a lottery, which is this point about $1 invested, 27 yeah. 
and, and naturally I was sort of simplified, I didn't go into details in the story, but of course, if you buy enough tickets, you're going to have, you're going to have a very good chance of covering not just the six out of 49 or whatever it is, but also the five and getting lots of the second thing. So things are more complicated than I've had time to describe in this little example. Yeah. Uh, David, uh, an anecdote uh, illustrating one of your laws uh, leading to a question. Um, our street holds a street party every year, and at a recent one, uh, I discovered talking to a neighbor that their birthday was the same as that of my son, which my wife thought was very unusual, of course it's not. And I, I went away and, and sort of roughly worked out how many of those probably would have occurred in that group of people, but yeah. nobody else happened to have that conversation, and there were probably 10 in the street. Um, but this is um, one of the laws, clearly, here is the law of near enough. But the point I'm making is, is, aren't there two types of event? There are those where, if you've been struck five times by lightning, it's probably got to the newspapers, and we, and we have a rough idea of how likely this is. But there's all these other events that go on, like all the, the matches of birthdays to yeah, you yeah. in this room, yeah. probably two or three, but which we don't discover. Yeah. So isn't yeah. there another probability of sort of a discovery involved in this? I, I think that's absolutely right. And then when you do discover it, you sort of pull it out. You draw attention to it. What an amazing thing. I mean, the, if the receptionist at the hotel hadn't pointed out to me that the two, my name, you know, were the two of us staying there that week, I wouldn't have noticed. So there's lots of, lots of things going on. And, and the human brain sort of, if it identifies a particular coincidence or match, it, it, focuses on that. Yeah. Uh, Blaise Egan, British Telecom. Um, talking about where uh, a one in a billion event has occurred, uh, you know, so many standard deviations from the mean, I think it's perfectly obvious that something is basically wrong with your model. And I think as modelers, we should be a bit more humble about this. I, I love reading about accidents and how they occurred. And I remember reading many years ago about a nuclear reactor in America that had a failure. And uh, I know that engineers make, uh, do failure modes analysis and they do fault trees and they try to anticipate anything that can fail. At the Indian Point reactor, uh, an initial failure occurred in a tunnel and an engineer went to investigate. Unable to locate a flashlight, he took a candle. In doing so, he set fire to the plastic insulation on some wiring on the, on the tunnel wall and caused a major failure. Now, that doesn't appear in anybody's fault tree analysis, I'm sure. In fact, um, one aspect of some of these laws is um, the, um, the law of the probability lever. Are, I, I also describe correlated events which people are regarding as independent. Uh, you know, if they don't take into account, in fact, that they're not actually independent, they can get very incorrect probability calculations and, and, and predictions. So, Anthony Rubin from BBC News. Um, can I throw in a small correction, which is perhaps a bit picky, but you were talking about how uh, accidents, uh, people being killed on the railways are very unusual, regards to what the uh, media interest in them might make you think. But of course, there is an inverse correlation between media interest and how probable something is. Ah, very good point. Yes. As you'll see yes. from our interest in this plane crash this week. That's a very good point. People um, argue that uh, the occurrence of a highly improbable event justifies the inference that the event was caused by an intelligent designer or a supernatural being, a creator, and so on. Does your work uh, have any bearing on whether that's a valid inference or not? Yeah. <laughs> I think that you can almost always explain those sorts of things in terms of the improbability principle and mathematical laws. So I suppose the short answer to your question is yes. <laughs> Thanks for a fascinating talk, David. Um, from recollection of my reading uh, Teenage Science Fiction, Douglas Adams took your improbability principle to its logical conclusion and said that if the universe is big enough, it contains multiple universes where everything that could possibly ever have happened has happened. And I think that they sort of jump between universes to find the universe which they like, as it were. But uh, do you have any comments on that? That's the law of truly large numbers, where truly large is truly large, yes. Yeah. I do talk about multiverses and so on in, in a later chapter of the book. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Any more questions for David, or um, would you like to carry on questioning him downstairs? Or would you just like a drink? <laughs> Going, going, gone. David, thank you very much. Thank you very much.